Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for D.R. Hanny. Hey, Tony, you didn't mention that you blog at the Nervous Breakdown also. Hi, that's you too. Okay, I'm just going to read a bit from Band for Life. Um, all you need to know about this section is that uh, this takes place in the early 80s. And uh, it's two kids, punk rock kids in North Carolina. It's a little hard to stand up here. Uh, um, small town in North Carolina always being uh, screwed with because of the way they look. Um, they've been talking about moving to New York City, and this um, bit is about how they come to move to New York. Okay. One Saturday night, toward the end of April, I went to the record store to pick up Pee Wee. Pee Wee's this little kid, uh, one of the two kids, who works at the record store. It must have been around 7 o'clock and halfway home we stopped at a Burger King to grab a bite to eat. We should never have gone there. We should have gone to some place near the university where people were typically more tolerant, but even then the manager might refuse the service, or other customers might complain or try in more obnoxious ways to start trouble. That was especially true of poor white trash, and this particular Burger King was in a shopping center next to a Kmart where the bumpkins from surrounding counties came to shop. Still, we foolishly stopped there, and just as we should have expected, somebody threw something at us, an ice cube or french fry or something, and we looked across the room and saw four teenage guys smirking our way, at least one of them wearing a letter jacket from a backwater high school, Pee-wee still had his mohawk, I'd recently shaved mine off, and then one of the kids yelled, What tribe are you from? The faggot tribe? And Pee-wee said, No, I'm from the fuck you tribe. And that was it. There was no escalation, no sense that something bad was about to happen. They left a few minutes later, and we finished eating and walked outside ourselves, and suddenly I heard Pee-wee shout, Jason, look out! And the second he said that, somebody jumped on my back, bringing me down on the pavement. I went down hard, or me and the kid on my back both did, and somehow I managed to shut him and saw another kid raising his foot to kick me while smirking down as if to say, yeah, he's talking shit now. I had no idea where Pee Wee was. I rolled over to avoid getting kicked and grabbed this kid by the leg, tripping him, and he and I grappled for however long and exchanged a few blows. I must have hit him pretty good, or maybe he just got scared, but he got up and ran away, and then I stood myself and saw a number of people in the parking lot frozen in place and staring with blank expressions. Then somebody else jumped me from behind, once again taking me down, and we rolled over and over on the pavement, duking it out. He was really strong, a farm kid, no doubt, and at one point he had me pinned down, slugging away on top of me, when he suddenly jerked his head back and screamed in agony while clutching the back of his neck. The whole scene was really confusing, but that one moment is as vivid now as it was at the time. He stumbled to his feet and staggered away, still clutching the back of his neck. And a second later, PB came running around the other side of the Burger King and said, Let's go! Viva! Everything was spinning right on. I kept looking around for the car and couldn't see it. The PB said, Jason, it's right in front of you! And so it was. We got in the car and peeled out of the parking lot. And I said, What the fuck happened? What do you mean what happened? Those fuckers jumped us. Well, yeah, I know that happened, but what happened to you? Well, he said he saw those guys as we were walking out of the restaurant. He took off running, and one of them chased him all the way to Kmart. Then he realized the guy wasn't there anymore, so he ran back and saw this other guy attacking me. And knowing the guy would tear him to pieces if he joined the brawl himself, he stabbed him with a ballpoint pen and ran away. The pen was still in his hand. He was very proud of himself, and for a moment I was too. There was a brief sense of celebration, a sense of, we showed them. But then I realized something. If that kid was badly hurt, we were deep in shit. I asked Pee Wee how hard he stabbed him, and he said, pretty hard, but Jason, I had to do something. It looks like he was killing you. Yeah, but you may have killed him. Je Jesus Christ, man, you know what's gonna happen? They're gonna call the police to say, we started it, and you know who they're gonna believe. But we didn't, they jumped us, and it was just a fucking pin. Doesn't matter, man, he could die if he stabbed him in the right place. No, 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 we gotta get out of here. We gotta pack up our shit and get the fuck out of here now. And go where? Where do you fucking think, New York? But for a few minutes, he kept saying it was self-defense, and there were plenty of witnesses who backed us up, and it was only a goddamn pin, that's all it was. Nobody could die from a single stab while inflicted by a goddamn pin. I said, Bernard, do you really want to go to jail? Because that's where we're going. And yeah, they might let us out in a couple of days, but that's still long enough for somebody to rape your fucking ass. 
That sold him. We got to a place, Suzanne wasn't there, so I threw her shit in the back of my car. There was bruises and bleeding from scrapes all over my body, but there was no time to think about that. I was so convinced we were about to be arrested. Then, as we were taking the stereo apart, PB suddenly announced he was telling his parents. I said, are you out of your mind? It's like leaving the cops a map. I can't just disappear. Suzanne, that's his sister, is going to come home and, and find me missing. They're going to blame her. I've got to call them, Jason. I'll tell them, I don't know. We're moving them to LA to start a band, and maybe in a few weeks I can tell them where I really am. So he called his parents while I down a thousand deaths, thinking he was going to slip up and tell them what was really going on. But he didn't. He stuck to his story. At first he spoke to his mom, but then his dad came in the line, and he spoke so loud it was like he was standing in the next room. Bernard, I heard him say, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay right there and stay in school. We had enough of this. And if you drop out after all we've done for you, you can forget you're even my son. And Peter said, yeah, you've done so much for me. You guys don't even want me around. I'm serious, Bernard. If you drop out of school, you can forget I even exist. And that goes for your mother, too. Then Peter's face turned so red it was almost purple. And he said, well, fuck you both then. I'm going to live my life the way I want to. And there's not a goddamn thing you can do to stop me. You worthless, talent, soulless, uh, soulless sellout. Then his father hung up with a click so loud it sounded like an ammo clip being slipped inside a gun and he stood perfectly still. Then he moved. He threw the phone against the wall, smashing it. Then he picked up the table and threw that against the wall, smashing that as well. Even as small as he was, he was terrifying at that moment. With his inky mohawk and face rage red, he looked like a miniature Travis Pickle. Then he lunged for the stereo, and I said, Bernard, no. Once again, he froze before he sank to the floor like a marionette. Some strings have just been cut, and he cried. Uh, all right, I think we'll leave it right there. Uh, thank yeah. you very much.